Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Chang Xiao, a pediatric clinical pharmacist in National Taiwan University Hospital. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to share my experience of becoming a pediatric clinical pharmacist. As you can see, this is our children's hospital. We have had pediatric clinical pharmacy service for over 10 years. Our team has three pediatric clinical pharmacists. One is in pediatric critical care and another is in pediatric surgical ICU. And my specialty is pediatric hemo-oncology. Hope today's sharing will be helpful to you. This is my outline. So today I would like to talk about the development of our services. And it's a long and challenging journey. It takes over two decades to have today's services. So I would like to share our training program and the clinical service we provide. And pharmacists in our hospital must get their basic training uh, program passed first. And if they want to be clinical pharmacy, they could receive the advanced training program. So I will take my experience as an example. Hope this will be more clear for you to see uh, our training program. Less, in the last, I will talk about our what service we provide in our hospital, especially my services. So this is our chef pharmacist. We've been improving e-prescribing and e-dispensing system in recent years. And this is the picture we won the National Healthcare Quality Award for the E-Generation Intelligent Pharmacy Services last year. We hope the improvement of this uh, e-dispensing system could help us reduce the errors and the workload. So you can see here, we put a barcode on each prescription so that once the pharmacist gets the barcode, the uh, system will show the pharmacy which drug you should take. The red light will, uh, will guide them to take the drug they should take. So these are our uh, outpatient services and inpatient, and of course, this is the chemotherapy dispensing room, and we also provide pharmacy clinics. So let's start from the very beginning. The pharmacists in Taiwan are part of oriented rather than patient oriented in the 1990s. In fact, uh, medication dispensing is still the pharmacist's primary duty, and it's takes tons of time to do in our day. And this is still a pharmacist shortage right now that makes uh, the develop development of clinical pharmacy harder. So come back to our story, at that time in the 1990s, we are trying to reform pharmacy education and provide the first clinical pharmacy service in surgical ICU and then family medicine. And in the education part, the practical in hospital uh, pharmacy was very little in the 1990s, not to mention the clinical pharmacy internship. So the practical course was extended to a whole semester and set up the postgraduate education program in 1993. The primary purpose is to focus more on pharmacotherapy and clinical internship. The clinical inter pharmacy internship students take more time to join the medical team and the medication, the medical intervention from students are all under clinical supervision by preceptors. So under this positive circulation, we cultivate uh, more and more clinical pharmacists yearly under such education reform. So we are trying to uh, make a more advanced education program in the next. In the education part, uh, after years ever, we formally in independently established the uh, Graduate Institute of Clinical Pharmacy in 2000. Uh, and it's not just a program as before, it's for advanced education and cultivation of professional clinical pharmacists. In response to the change in pharmacy practice, the School of Pharmacy has reformed its curriculum and program structure. So in 2009, the six year PharmD program was established and coexist with the four year Bachelor of Pharmacy program. This double check system was closed and replaced by the six year system in 2015. 
We believe the six-year pharmacy program will further enhance the pharmacy profession and pharmacy practice uh, environment in the long run. So this is the education part. Uh, in the hospital part, the PGI training program was introduced in 2007. And this is pushed by, this is pushed nationally by the government policy to enhance the pharmacy skills of young pharmacists. As we talked about previously, our first uh, clinical pharmacy service was in 1991, the surgical ICU. And after 10 more years, our clinical pharmacy service was or it's extended to all ICUs in our hospital in 2008. So this is a huge uh, input, huge uh, step uh, to be more, explore more clinical pharmacy services. So in the same year, our, hospital, our children's hospital was opened and pediatric clinical pharmacy service was provided uh, in the following year. And over two decades of development, our hospital has offered pharmacy clinics, including anticoagulants, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and so on. Uh, in addition to the clinical services, we are trying to hold clinical workshops for all pharmacies in Taiwan annually in, since uh, 20, 2013. And the topics mainly focus on the treatment of disease from pharmacy's perspective. We hope to improve overall pharmacy's clinical pharmacy competencies through these workshops. And we set up the advanced uh, pharmacy training program uh, formally in, also in uh, 2013. So this program provides an excellent way to train pharmacists with passion for uh, clinical health practice. So not only us, the our government also support us in developing clinical pharmacy services. Taiwan FDA started to include some pharmacy clinics and ICU pharmacy services in the National Health uh, Insurance Benefit Package in 2019. And this is our clinical pharmacy services. So you can see from just start from the 1990s to till today, we now have 24 clinical pharmacies in our hospital. So, and you can see here my clinical services, uh, pediatric hemoncology just started last year. So I, I will try to show you our pharmacy training program from my experience. So let's start from the basic pharmacy training program. And these pictures are our general pharmacies in daily routine. And of course, you can see that do the patient education, medication dispensing, prescription verification. And this is our inpatient pharmacy services pharmacists. And they form a study group and discuss or present a topic review every two to three weeks. And sometimes they will invite the clinical pharmacy to have some uh, comment or recommendation or suggestion. And this is a uh, uh, this is all the daily job I do before becoming a clinical pharmacist. So I would like to talk about the pharmacy PGR training program first. This program aimed to uh, enhance the basic skill of young pharmacists. So every new hospital pharmacist need to receive PGI training for two years in our hospital. And young pharmacists uh, have training in inpatient and outpatient services. Uh, Every pharmacist will be assigned a preceptor for supervision. Preceptors are responsible for assisting young pharmacists in patient education, prescription, verification, and other basic pharmacy skills. I was trained from 2013 to 2016. This is my learning passport. It's just like a STEM collection. Once I finish a mission, I get a step. So in the inpatient service, the primary training purpose is patient uh, care. So like uh, therapy drug monitoring, reviewing inpatient medications order, and checking the DDI drug drug indication or adjusting, adjusting dosage by organ function, or answering the drug information requests from other health, health professionals. 
But in the outpatient service, uh, they focus more on patient education, a little different from the inpatient services. So they aim to provide patients how to use their medication correctly and safely. So this is the uh, most difference between these two uh, services. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, and so the verification and the medication review are pretty uh, difficult for young pharmacists. So we are required to attend to attend the basic uh, education called curriculum, either online or in-person courses. And you can see here the uh, education involves the very question, of course, and also therapeutic drug monitoring. And we also offer the pediatric uh, PKMPD and how to verify the uh, pediatric orders and how to retrieve the drug information and answer the drug information questions. And the last is the most important, I think, uh, the patient education and the communication skills. And after this, after this two day uh, curriculum, we have to pass the exam to get a certification and we need to attach this uh, certification in our learning passport before we finish it. So we also have other evaluation sheets like the DOPS or mini CX, and the preceptor could provide their appraisal opinions in these sheets to the trainees. And besides, we also have to receive the practice, practice test uh, they are containing both the dispensing process and clinical knowledge and patient education. So this is a little hard for the young pharmacists. And of course, the PGI pharmacists have opportunity to join the world round to see how the clinical pharmacy works in the medical team. So they will have at least one month to follow the clinical pharmacist. And at that month, they could also make recommendations or document uh, pharmaceutical care under pharmacy, clinical pharmacy's supervision. So this kind of learning not only give us the clinical knowledge, but also give us a chance to see if we are really interested in clinical pharmacy. So you can see here, this is the attending physicians, medical uh, resident and nurse Partitioner, and this is our clinical pharmacist, and this is our PGI pharmacist. And sometimes we will have pharmacy students with us. And at the end of PGI training program, we have to present a topic review to all pharmacists in the weekly pharmacy meeting. And this is a, a huge challenge for the young pharmacist uh, be, uh, to present a very tough topic uh, before in front of the senior pharmacist. So this is the evaluation of our final training efforts. So, and this is my uh, final report topic. I review the mechanism of in vitro fertilization and the medications, and then give some clinical cases in the end. So basically this is our two year PGI training programs content. And after uh, the basic uh, pharmacy training, how did I become a clinical pharmacist? In 2016, as I mentioned, we have uh, two clinical ph pediatric pharmacists before, and one of them uh, went on maternity leave for two years. And at that time, I just happened to be transferred to uh, children's hospital pharmacy. So I received on the pediatric pharmacy training, especially on congenital heart disease for swimmers. And after that, I took the pediatric surgical ICU for uh, two years. So it's a long time. And the majority of the pediatric surgical ICU care is post op care and ECMO care. And most patients are congenital heart disease and some neurologic disease like uh, AVN, a, a arterial venous malformation or brain tumors. And sometimes you will have, you will have some GI surgery patients. And although being a pediatric clinical pharmacist is totally an accident for me, uh, but during these two years, I think I enjoy this job. So after my temporary clinical pharmacist in pediatric surgery ICU, I 
try to explore some new uh, services in pediatric uh, clinical pharmacy. So I think maybe we could do something on uh, hematology or oncology. So I applied for a scholarship from our hospital for a board training. I was trained in the GMPs and NICU at the UIC and then pediatric hemo-oncology world in Coma Children's Hospital, also in Chicago, for six months from 2019 to 2020. So you can see here, this is the chemotherapy order. The doctor will write the prescription, and then the pharmacy will do the double check, and then the nurse will do the triple check. But I think they are uh, becoming uh, e-prescribing, I think. And this is the uh, work run in the uh, Homer Children's Hospital with the uh, pediatric clinical pharmacist in oncology and hematology. But unfortunately, I went back to Taiwan earlier due to the pandemic. So our supervisor of clinical pharmacy service uh, arranged another advanced clinical pharmacy training for me after I went back. But as you know, we had no clinical service in pediatric hemo-oncology. So he offered me adult hemo-oncology, hematology training for three months. In the first month, I focused uh, on reviewing the medical treatment of common hematology disease, like ALL, AML, lymphoma, like that. And also join the morning nation for medical residents, it's HEMA beginners classes, uh, it's very useful. So I also discussing this topic with my uh, preceptors in the first month met, and this made me familiarize with this topic more uh, quicker. And the following month, I stay in the bone marrow transplanting, the preceptors the preceptor took me to check the BMT protocol step-by-step step and a special consideration for BMT patients. The last month in the hematology world, the training was on direct patient care. We discussed the patients so every morning and then get the recommendation to the doctors. After the work runs in the morning, I also need to present some topics briefly to my preceptor during the last month. And I also have two presentations to all clinical pharmacists as part of my training results. So I choose the free string inhibitor in ML. That's a very hard topic at that time. And also the hemophagocytosis syndrome. This is sometimes you will see in the pediatric uh, hematology patients. So finally, I finished my advanced training program in January 2021. As I talked on the previous slide, we have the Advanced Clinical Pharmacy Training Program. This is our manual on training planning in Mandarin. I will briefly introduce our uh, training program here. Uh, pharmacies, uh, first of all, I need to talk uh, criteria. A pharmacy must have experience in hospital and clinical pharmacy related degrees. But we have different criteria for the bachelor degrees and from the degrees. A pharmacist with only bachelor degrees must have four years or more experience in hospital. But the from the degree or the master degree in clinical pharmacy, they only need two more years uh, experience in hospital. But the most important is uh, no matter what your degree is, you should pass the uh, advanced pharmacotherapy exam first. And then the supervisor of clinical pharmacy will arrange the training program for you. And the, train, the formal training duration is about six months. The training, planning, the training plan is designed individually by the supervisor and the training sites are dependent on your specialty. The contents of the training program are a direction, uh, uh, direct patient care and join the world rounds and also a topic presentation. And just like what uh, I was trained in the advanced uh, pharmacy training program. So this is our eva evaluation sheets for the clinical pharmacists and also 
uh, and also the training uh, in the advanced uh, pharma clinical pharmacy training. And the supervisor would assess our performance via the attitude and pharmacotherapy knowledge and communication skill, medication recon reconciliation, and direct patient care, TPN, ADR, EDM assessment, and of course the teaching. As you can see here, the pharmacotherapy education, pharmacotherapy knowledge and the direct, direct patient care are at, at a higher pro proportion. So this two uh, part is the most important the supervisor care. So about our evaluation sheet, we need to see the ACCP criteria. As the ACCP published the clinical pharmacy competencies, which you can find in the pharmacotherapy in 2017. They mentioned that clinical pharmacists should be competent in six essential domains. Direct patient care, uh, pharmacotherapy knowledge, system-based care and population health, communication skill, professionalism, and continuing professional uh, developing. So our hospital modified the ACCP, ACCP criteria as our performance evaluation sheet for the clinical pharmacies as the previous slide I showed you. So let's move on to the final part uh, what services do I provide in the pediatric HEMA college after finishing my training program? So the uh, services started in February 2021. And I the service I provide, I would like to categorize by the ACCP clinical pharmacist competencies. So first I will talk about the direct patient care and the pharmacotherapy knowledge. And during the world run, uh, the primary care residents always uh, need our support to adjust the medication dosage uh, or choose a better individualized therapy or avoid uh, potential drug interactions or manage the potential drug interactions. So we are so close, but as you know, the medical residents, they are only here for one month. So sometimes I need to act as a bridge between the attending physician and the medical residents to prevent some misunderstandings because they are now very familiar with the chemotherapy. And also we need to partic participate in the morning meeting and the multidisciplinary discussion. And sometimes I need to offer medication information especially the novel drugs in the pharmacy's uh, view. Uh, as we know, the hematology, there's more and more drugs, new drugs uh, in recent years. So pediatric hematology and oncology contain plenty of regimens and chemotherapy and supportive care are very complex. So we should help doctor check patients' chemotherapy sheet to reduce the medication errors in daily routine. So basically, I will confirm the patient's treatment in the world rounds with attending physicians and check the sheet after work. So this is the e portal we write the pre uh, chemotherapy sheet. So I will check this for the patient. And the second is the system best care. As we know, chemotherapy order must be double or even triple check. So, and there are more and more chemoimmunotherapy in the standard care of cancer patients. So not only the doctors, but also nurses are not familiar with these new treatments. Therefore, the well-established protocols and templates are what I have done recently. So this is the individualized uh, protocol we write, and this is the template about uh, immunotherapy in our uh, portal system. As I mentioned, a growing number of chemoimmunotherapies are challenging for clinical health care providers. They are very different from traditional chemotherapies. So our fellow resident and I make the management flowchart for new therapies. And this one is the CS management for CAR-T therapy, and the other is the management of side effect of anti-GD2 treatment. 
And the last is the continuing professional de development. Uh, this is a crucial thing we should do. Clinical, the clinical treatments are changing so quickly, especially in the hematology in recent year. And keeping ourselves updated could also give patient better health care. So attending medical conference or uh, online meetings are all great ways to follow the newest knowledge. Another way is to give a speech to other healthcare providers. Uh, so during the past year, I present the management of immunotherapy and also share the PKMP of pediatrics at the annual meeting. Uh, so all this knowledge sharing forced me to examine issues more closely and to integrate the knowledge I already have. And beyond the clinical services, uh, we still have to do uh, teaching and research. So as you know, we are the teaching hospital. We are responsible for the students' internship and the PGI training program. Uh, basically, you could see a lot of contents are no different when we teach the PGI pharmacists or students. But pharmacists have their daily work to do, like online dispensing or verifying prescriptions. And students are students, so uh, the assignments for students are more than pharmacists. This is the uh, only difference when we teach the students or the pharmacists, pediatric pharmacists. And about the research, our chef pharmacists hold the research seminar monthly and invite the pharmacy professors at National Taiwan University to join. And the feedback and recommendation and resource sharing really help us to do the research, especially from the pharmacy professors. And my future plan, of course, I will keep updating the protocols and management flow charts. And I do the patient education for some specific drugs and conditions already. But actually, our head nurse and nurses have offered the chemotherapy education for a long while. So I will try to focus more on, on medications and try to integrate uh, our education together. And, and, uh, and, and in the end, uh, the busofen TDN is not, is not available in our hospi hospital. So I would like to try to do this TDN because uh, doing this of TDN really reduce the side effect like the VOD, venal occlusive disease and improve the engraftment. So I would like to, uh, to try to figure out how to do the of TDN in, for our children in our hospital. So this is uh, my future plan. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I hope you all enjoy my talk today. Thank you.